Thank you. Right. Now we're going to try and have a, a conversation, but facing out like this okay. in a really natural as, way. As okay? we normally do. Are you ready yeah. for that? Um, obviously, there's a lot of people in the audience. In fact, I, I'm sure everyone in the audience has seen at least a smattering of, of, of those performances in different things. The only person who probably hasn't seen them is you. Yeah. Because you don't like watching yourself at all. Do I you? can't stand it. No. Why? What is it? Is it you know particular well, what, what, performances it, or? <laughs> watching is bad. Listening is even worse. I find uh, I would rather watch with my fingers in my ears than listen with my fingers in my eyes. That doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? No, I, I so vaguely um, know what you mean. Uh, but of course, you um, you have such a beautiful. Voice. Don't You're, try no, don't and change know. the subject. When I don't know. I just. Um, I'm very self-conscious, I think, which is, it, I know is odd. It it's, doesn't seem to fit with the career I've chosen. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I just don't care for it. But so I think I'm right in saying that you originally began acting at school in an effort to attract girls. So did that override your sense of, of Well, of that overrides discomfort? pretty much everything, <laughs> doesn't it? That certainly when you're young. Yes, I suppose that's true. I think. I think that's probably true of a lot of male performers, certainly when they're young, the idea of having an opportunity to show off to girls is, is what drives them to do what they do. Um, and I do remember, I do remember that when I started to do it professionally, it, it, very, it was a very odd experience. In my mind, the audience stopped being girls and they became men. It became, <laughs> the audience became male and it was a lot of people with their arms folded just going, go on, they impress me. <laughs> and uh, the audience became an enemy to be sort of outwitted or, or outthought in some way. Um, and I'm happy to say, after a few years of that, it sort of settled down into a more a reasonably sane so now adult. So mixed gender um, audience exactly, now. Exactly, That's, yeah. Yes, I'm sure much better in all ways. Um, you've been described by close friends as phenomenally intelligent, wise, and <laughs> lovable. That was um, me, I said that. <laughs> close friends called yeah. HL. Um, uh, and uh, apparently, according to Stephen Fry, um, who knows you very, very well indeed, your only annoying habit um, is your extreme self-deprecation. Uh, is that something that's been a constant throughout your life? And is, I mean, obviously it's a defense mechanism, but what are you repelling? Um. I suppose, yes, it is a defense point. It's a kind of superstition, I think. I, I was raised in a, in a sort of Presbyterian household. Uh, God was not the, the principal feature. The main feature was that any sort of pride or vanity or uh, ornament, in fact, to one's life was papist. Um, and... Uh, which would uh, likely result in some sort of divine punishment. Anybody, who, if you ever took anything for granted or thought you'd done something well, it would be a, a vengeful God to come and take it away from you. I think is where it began. And then, of course, like a lot of things, it sort of, it becomes a habit. You just get into this sort of way of doing things. And even if you know it's annoying to other people and it's not even particularly productive for yourself, you keep on doing it. I mean, I think human beings do this throughout their lives. We're all struggling to sort of overcome these ridiculous habits that we've um, gathered about ourselves. And this is one I haven't actually managed to conquer. And yet, here I am. Well, I was sake, going to say, and yet basking, here you are. I'm basking. <laughs> basking um, in, yeah. in glory, uh, receiving uh, an Outstanding Achievement I Award. Know, I know. And not everyone may be aware that you've also been awarded an OBE in 2007, a CBE in 2018 for your services to drama. So do none of those things boost the old self-esteem? Particularly, of course, the well, Outstanding no. Achievement Award here at Edinburgh. Uh, th this, this is the one that stands, this is the, the, the jewel <laughs> in the mire, um, needless to say. <laughs> but um, I can remember, this sounds very boastful, but I was at Buckingham Palace. I bet it doesn't sound well, boastful it, at all, it's just in so your I terms. Was, I, was, I was up for this thing and I was wearing a tailcoat and it was all lots of trumpets and swords and men with feathers in their hats. And there's a chap who reads out your sort of citation for the, the, the award you're going to get. And the two people before me 
they were two soldiers, these incredibly fit-looking young men, who, and he read out the citation, and it, was, it had come from a sort of boy's comic book from the 1950s. They had rescued orphans from a, a burning building while under machine gun fire, one of them having, losing his leg, reattaching it, losing it again. I can't remember. It went on and on and on. The bravery that they showed was just absolutely astounding. And they won this, this gallantry medal. And then the chap said, <laughs> and I could, I could, I didn't blame him for it, but I could just detect this sneer in his voice as he said, <laughs> for services to drama. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's just ridiculous. I mean, if you put the two things alongside each other, yes, I was a totally unworthy time waster at that particular event. <laughs> Um, Your but, interpretation, but, again. But that's, that's, uh, it's, an, it's not a sane world. It seems very fitting that you should be here receiving your Outstanding Achievement Award at Edinburgh because, of course, it's uh, where you first won an award, I think. I, I don't know about school days uh, awards, but uh, you won the first ever Perrier Award, which is now called the Edinburgh Comedy Award, um, along with the Cambridge Footlights That's Review true, yeah. Team. And that was at the Fringe in 1981. Do you remember yeah. at all what that felt like and whether there I, was a degree of surprise at, at receiving such an accolade on your first I, major comedy outing? It was, it was absolutely astounding. Um, I can remember being sort of overwhelmed by it. Um, being presented the award by Rowan Atkinson, who, who was, to us was like a grand old man. He's probably about 18 months older, but um, <laughs> he seemed like um, Elijah, you know, had come onto the stage to give us this award, and it was an amazing thing. But the, what I do remember, though, at the time is there was, there was very little opportunity to see other shows, so I didn't really know what, what the category meant, what sort of shows were on, what people were doing. Stand-up comedy as a as the enormous sort of rock star stadium filler that it is now had not yet really happened. So I didn't, I didn't really know what we were up against, but nonetheless, it was an, an absolutely overwhelming uh, thing. To Who happen. was we? Who was in that particular review? Do you uh, remember? That was a fellow called uh, Stephen Fry, oh, yeah. um, who I th went on to become a broadcaster. Um, <laughs> And uh, Emma Thompson, likewise, uh, <laughs> Tony Slattery, Penny Dwyer, and Paul Shearer. Um, and we had been doing, we'd been touring with a two hour show that summer, and then we cut it down to a one hour for, the, um, uh, for, for our friend show. And it was an interesting experience. We had this, we had a two hour show that had sort of ups and downs. We thought, well, that's strong, that's less strong, that's very strong. That it, and then we thought, well, if we put that into an hour, if we put all the strong bits into an hour, we're going to have an absolute bulletproof hour. And what we discovered is that you get the exact same sort of waveform appears no matter what you do, no matter what order you put them in. An audience is happy now, a little bit bored, wants it to change. Oh, it has changed. Now we're bored again. Now we're starting to think about the bus and what we're... You know, you get the same sort of waveform no matter the length of the show. That it's we... quite good if you could keep that graph in front of you. Yeah, exactly. At all times. In fact, I could well, I have it today. I have actually witnessed this, I mean, represented on a computer screen. I, I wrote a pilot a long time ago for CBS, and it, when we made this pilot, and it was tested the way Americans test absolutely everything, except testing, weirdly. Um, <laughs> quiz custodia. They never test the testers. Um, and I got to see, uh, so the audience members are given a knob. You probably know all this. You're all, for heaven's sake, you're they all professional. test everything these days. Yeah, right? and you turn the knob to the left if you're bored, and you turn it to the right if you're amused, and that gets rendered on the screen in a waveform, um, so, which is incredibly distracting and disheartening in many ways if you were telling a joke about an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman. I know nobody tells those jokes anymore. It's just convenient for my purposes. They would just say, oh, I didn't like the Englishman bit, and I didn't like the Scotsman bit. The Irishman bit was funny. So they want to take out the first two parts that are indispensable to and what's funny about get the third to it. part. Exactly. Which is difficult when you spend a whole career on build-up. Yeah, which yeah. is what I have done. I'm all, I'm all build-up. Yeah, yeah. Or one of these days. 